My name is Julian Johansson. I'm Director of Research and Training here at Nonprofit Vote. If you're not familiar with us, founded in 2005, Nonprofit Vote partners with America's nonprofits to help the people they serve participate and vote. We are a leading source of training materials and other resources for nonprofits doing nonpartisan voter engagement work. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, uh, David Levitt. Um, David is principal or a principal at Adler and Colvin. His practice focuses on representation of nonprofit and tax exempt organizations with an emphasis on program related investment, social enterprise, political advocacy, and nonprofit corporate governance. David's the author of numerous papers on nonprofit law and was a contributing editor to the Alliance for Justice's guidebook for nonprofits, which is called The Rules of the Game, a guide to election-related activities for 501c3 nonprofits. Before joining Adler and Colvin, uh, David practiced as a corporate attorney focusing in the areas of corporate and transactional law. He has his BA from Cornell University and his JD from Harvard Law School. David, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Julian. All right, why don't so, I hand it over to you at this point? Great. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, a few quick notes before I start with the slides. Uh, I am going to address the IRS rules for, not, for organizations that are tax exempt under Section 501c3. So uh, there are other rules for organizations that are exempt under other sections of the tax code, like si Section 501c4 social welfare organizations. In many cases, our clients are working together, C3 and C4 organizations, and have questions relating to those relationships. I'm happy to answer questions, but the substance is going to focus on 501c3 charities. Secondly, I'm going to focus on the U.S. tax law governing charities. I'm not going to cover federal, state, or local election or campaign finance laws. These laws obviously may also affect the conduct of your activities and what's acceptable for a 501c3 organization to conduct. And last but not least, I am not going to talk about legislative lobbying uh, to any great extent, which is really a sub separate subject, subject to separate rules under the Internal Revenue Code. We will talk briefly about ballot measures, which are voted on in elections at the same time as voting for candidates, but otherwise we're really focusing on candidate-related activities. So uh, here is the agenda we'll be following. Note uh, included staff activities at the end as the last bullet point. And uh, we may touch on that briefly. Uh, if we run out of time, we won't touch on that. That is something that we covered, uh, that I covered in a presentation last year. Julian says that's still available on YouTube, and the, uh, and the PowerPoint is available as well. So uh, we won't, we may not get to that today. And let's start with uh, what. Here's briefly what you cannot do as a 501c. Charity, and here's something that you can do. Any questions? Um, no, those are just a few slides I like to start with, um, but really we're going to dig into this by starting with the Johnson Amendment uh, to start with what a charity cannot do. So here is the basics of the electioneering prohibition directly from uh, this is language that is contained in Section 501c3 uh, and the accompanying Treasury regulations. So in order to qualify as tax exempt as a charity under the Internal Revenue Code, the organization may not participate in or intervene in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. Uh, this is often, um, as you can see, this was not always the law being added to the tax code in 1954. This is often referred to as the Johnson Amendment. Um, that has been the news quite a bit recently. As you may have been aware, uh, President Trump has vowed to completely destroy the Johnson Amendment, and it has been the subject of a recent executive order addressing it. So I thought after Trump was, after his campaign in his first 100 days in office, we might be having a very different conversation. It might be a lot shorter of a conversation um, if the Johnson Amendment were to be removed, and that would effectively remove this prohibition on 501c3 charities conducting partisan um, not uh, partisan candidate related activities. Um, there is an executive order. Uh, that being said, many experts in our area believe the executive order is not likely to have significant effect or will have a minimal effect on current enforcement in this area. And of course, it would take legislative action in revising the tax code to actually remove the Johnson Amendment entirely. Uh, I'm happy to take questions on that. I do think it's worth noting 
that in addition to the executive order, there is some alternative legislation out there that would alter this prohibition on um, um, political act, partisan political activity by charities. Um, there's a bill specifically that would try to limit it, uh, to, to allow certain activity, for instance, if it was regular and customary and did not result in any ad incremental additional expense um, unless it was a de minimis expense. So uh, again, that's not the law. That's legislation. I don't know what kind of legs it has, but um, it's worth knowing that there's more than just an either it's in or it's out. There are some um, proposals to sort of modify this Johnson Amendment, and of course that would significantly affect everything we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about what that means. Uh, the provision of the tax code, obviously it prohibits any endorsement of candidates or making contributions to candidates' campaigns. With respect to conducting any partisan-related, election-related activity, for tax purposes, the IRS will consider any and all facts and circumstances that it deems relevant in determining whether a campaign intervention has occurred. Applying this sort of facts and circumstances test, the IRS has interpreted Section 501c3 to permit quite a variety of election-related activities as long as they're conducted in a nonpartisan manner. And hopefully one of the uh, objectives of a session like this is to realize that you, as a C3 organization, can actually do quite a bit um, to get involved in an election period without actually violating this uh, partisan, um, prohibition on partisan campaign activity. Now, when is an activity considered nonpartisan? In general, that is for C3 purposes when it is not biased for or against the candidate um, and not structured in a way to help or hurt the chances of uh, the election of a candidate or a group of candidates such as a, you know, a specific party. Um, again, how does the IRS determine this? By all the relevant facts and circumstances, which can make this sometimes a, a, a tricky analysis. But C3 does allow charities to engage in educational activities, does allow charities to engage in a voter registration and get out the vote efforts, as long as they are not conducted in a biased or partisan manner that favors or, or, or uh, is unfavorable to a particular candidate or group of candidates. Uh, what if a charity does violate this prohibition? Uh, the worst case scenario, of course, the IRS can revoke 501c3 status. Uh, it can also impose excise taxes based on the amount the charity spent on the activity. Um, of course, there's also, if the IRS doesn't take any action or if it does, there's also the question of impact on reputation and goodwill. Um, certainly with opponents uh, in a political campaign, opponents will be uh, looking for any way to sort of uh, disperse the goodwill of a charity. So that's quickly a, a quick reference on uh, what a charity cannot do, and we're going to talk today about what a charity can do. Uh, the basic point here, and here's what we're going to be going over, there is no comprehensive statutory regulatory guidance on what nonpartisan means. Like I said, it's facts and circumstances. However, over the years, the IRS has issued guidance addressing very specific fact situations, different types of voter-related activities. Um, if you're, the exact fact situation has not been addressed by the IRS, uh, then we often have to reason by analogy to, to the events where we do have. This comes up a lot, for instance, with social media because that's still so new. But what we're going to talk today is where the IRS has issued guidance. Um, a lot of the examples I'm going to give, we don't typically uh, refer by name to a lot of revenue rulings unless we're talking to other tax lawyers, but it's worth bearing in mind there is a revenue ruling 2007-41. Uh, that is a ruling that covers a lot of these different areas in one place and gives examples of uh, different types of activities. And so a lot of what I'm discussing, I, I'm pulling from that revenue ruling. There's other guidance as well, but that's a great place to start. So if you're looking, if there's any IRS guidance you did actually pull, that revenue ruling would be, uh, would be the one in this area. And that's, again, revenue ruling 2007-41. Okay, so voter registration, we'll talk about first. So the voter registration process largely is governed by state law, as I'm sure you recognize, and it varies from state to state. But 501c3 organizations can encourage and may want to encourage and assist those who are eligible to register to vote. Uh, in addition, they might want to encourage them to actually vote when Election Day arrives. Uh, here's a slide uh, listing some common nonpartisan activities charities can do in connection with voter registration. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, again, things, this is, again, the focus on not endorsing candidates. We're talking about, well, how do you do the voter registration to get out the vote uh, without 
violating this uh, nonpartisan standard. So get out the vote typically refers to activities designed to help people register, but also you know, to get them not only to register, but to get them to the polls uh, to help them with the actual voting process. Now a charity can conduct voter registration and get out the vote activities done, as I said, in a strictly nonpartisan manner. And by that I mean the charity should be thinking both as to the content of the message and the targeting of the distribution. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the, um, the content of the message. A key point here is that the charity cannot refuse to register voters based on how they expect to vote. That's, I think, fairly obvious. Certainly you cannot call, have a phone bank, someone ask if they intend to vote Democrat, and if they say no, goodbye. And if they say yes, here's all the things we do to help you uh, get to the polls. That obviously would be a partisan effort. Here's where it gets a bit more nuanced. Uh, nor can a charity use particular issues to encourage registration or voting by those only on one side of those issues. So a charity can refer to a specific issue as a reason to vote. You can use an issue to mobilize voters. But the charity has to be careful not to either directly or indirectly tell or imply the, for the voter which way to vote based on their positions on an issue. And this can raise questions. Uh, voter registration that does not mention issues at all, get out the vote efforts, is the easiest, cleanest way to do voter reg, get out the vote. If you start to mention issues, it uh, can sometimes be an uncomfortable fit. Certainly certain polarizing issues, what we often call wedge issues, should be avoided. Issues that clearly divide the candidate was the environment or uh, health care. Obviously today we have a lot more wedge issues than maybe we have in other years. But there's always issues that can divide candidates, and you have to be careful referencing those in the context of a voter registration campaign. Um, because this could be viewed as an indirect way of telling people who they should be voting for. Um, so uh, you want to present those issues in a way that does not encourage the people you're speaking with to vote for a particular candidate or party. Now, with respect to whom you can target, a charity, a charity may target certain of their natural constituents or those who have been historically underrepresented in the democratic process. Uh, so a charity can target low-income minority, low-turnout voters, student populations, uh, the homeless, to exercise their right specifically target them because they're typically not represented at the polls. Um, and that generally will not, without more, be considered partisan, even if those groups statistically are more likely to vote for candidates of one party or another. Um, so uh, it, that's, I, I think it's helpful to know you can target, but of course you can't target based on something like belonging to a political party or because they voted a particular way in the past, because of course that would start to look like you are gearing the effort towards getting certain people to vote for a certain way, or only mobilizing those who are going to vote the way you want them to vote. Um, obviously, and I think what probably goes on saying, but I'll say it, you can't deny voter registration or get out the vote services based on party preferences or candidate preferences if that's provided. Um, so again, uh, I think targeting is, is, a, is an important point, uh, and some is allowed. Be careful of issue advocacy along with the voter registration. When determining whether or not you're going to involve an issue, you might ask why are you mentioning the issue in connection with the voter registration. Um, if you're trying to mobilize that people, that's fine. If you're trying to encourage people to vote one way or the other, um, that would be where you're more in a danger zone. But it's okay to try to overcome voters' apathy, perhaps to get them to the polls. Okay, and another point, this probably goes with everything we're going to talk about during a voter registration or get out the vote campaign. It's a good thing for a charity to instruct its employees and volunteers themselves to avoid. They, the, staff, the executive staff may, very, may be very clear on these rules, especially after a webinar such as this. But um, the volunteers and employees actually on the ground may not be as clear about the importance of this. So it is important to train and instruct your employees and volunteers to avoid saying or doing or writing anything. That could be indicative of a partisan purpose because many people may have a strong opinion about their election, but if they're out there doing get out the vote, um, that they need to keep those partisan instincts out of the process. So I have a few more slides here just describing, again, very typical voter education, get out the vote efforts, things that are absolutely fine to do, facts about how to register, where and when to vote, how to vote early, etc. That is all nonpartisan educational activity. And then here's some things you can do on Election Day. Um, again, as long as you're keeping the partisan activity, campaign materials, etc. Um, 
out of, out of the process. So I'll ask now, I guess, if there's any questions on get out the vote. It just seems like this may be a good opportunity. And Julian, if there's questions you want to pose now, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to um, engaging candidates. You know, we, we don't have a lot of accumulated questions yet, so why don't, why don't you continue and I'll, um, I'll just encourage people, you know, think about what you want to ask because it's not often you have a, um, uh, an expert like David um, available. If he, were, if he were billing for this, oh boy, holy cow. Um, <laughs> what, Julian, so I'm not billing for this? Oh, maybe we should have discussed Oh, that. darn, I should have told you about that. Okay. Always Go ask ahead. the lawyer if they're billing. Okay, so, uh, no, I'm not billing. The engaging candidates. So we're going to move on to this other topic here and talk a little bit about uh, candidate appearances first. Now, depending on the facts and circumstances, a, a charity can actually invite political candidates to speak at its events without any problem, without jeopardizing its tax exempt status or having an issue with the IRS. The first point I would make is let's distinguish between being, someone being invited in their capacity as candidates uh, as opposed to being invited to speak at an event or an appear an event at an event in a non-candidate capacity. Now, candidates, can, uh, you know, candidates often have work they've done before they've been candidates that is relevant to what the charity wants to address. So charities can use public figures, political figures who are candidates as well, who may be seen as partisan in, in, in the context of a campaign, but they can invite them for their events, for educational purposes or fundraising efforts, um, as long as we keep the campaign and their candidacy out of the event. So keep in mind this is distinct from inviting candidates as speakers in their capacity as candidates, which we'll talk about next. So for instance, a candidate may hold office currently or formerly have held office. That may be very relevant to what you want them to speak about. Uh, or they may be considered an expert in something uh, outside of uh, their candidacy. Or they have some other celebrity status or some distinguished status. You have to ask yourself, why are you inviting them to speak? If you're inviting them to give them exposure as a candidate, not a good reason. But there may be, they may have written a book that's very relevant to an event. And just because they're a candidate does not mean you cannot invite them. Candidates also can appear without an invitation at an event that are open to the public. You, that's not a violation. Um, uh, so you, know, you can have people speak in their non-candidate capacity. Factors the IRS would look at would include um, what, what the reasons you asked them to speak, and also making sure when they're there that that individual speaks only in their non-candidate capacity. We don't want, at that point, the candidacy, the candidate should not be talking about their candidacy or the election, should not make a mention of that. And uh, you know, all, again, all the relevant facts and circumstances in connection with the event are, are fair game. So there shouldn't be any campaign material, and there should be a general nonpartisan atmosphere um, you know, it's, it, we, what we worry about is the event turning into a campaign event. Um, candidates or their staff may not be as attuned to this as the charity. The charity needs to be aggressive about protecting its 501c3 status. We often provide memos and things like that that the charity can provide the candidate or put in the file to sort of help avoid that from happening. But that's, I think, the key is taking steps to avoid a nonpartisan event from turning into a partisan event. So what about... Um, candidate forums. Now this is when a candidate is invited to speak uh, in his or her capacity as a candidate. So C3 organizations, again, they can attempt to educate voters and encourage people to participate in the election by sponsoring candidate forums or debates where, um, either during the general election or even during the primaries. So um, the distinction that we typically make is a forum is a meeting or assembly for discussion of issues, and the candidates appear sequentially. So one week you're going to have one candidate, another week someone else. Contrast that with a debate uh, where candidates directly engage each other at the same time. So again, this is an area where the IRS has provided very specific guidance on how to conduct nonpartisan forums or, um, or debates without intervening in a political campaign. So these are, there's, a, there's a list of the things the IRS will look at, just to highlight some of them. Uh, it's about equal opportunity, right? The organization needs to provide equal opportunity to participate to all the, to all the candidates seeking the same office. Um, we'll talk about in a minute what if there's 15 candidates. But the idea is equal opportunity um, and, and, and uh, giving equal opportunity to, uh, to present their views. So, in other words, uh, you know, you, if you're going to have an event, and if it's going to be a sequential event, you have one candidate speak at your dinner, at your annual dinner, and you get 500 people, and, you've, and you invite the other candidate to come speak at your regular meeting every Tuesday at 2 p.m. where you get 15, 50 people, that's not an equal opportunity, and that's, 
uh, kind of facts and circumstances you want to watch out for. I mean, if you are going to advertise it, you want the advertising, the public announcement to be the same for each candidate. So you're doing everything to put them on the same um, basis for uh, getting an opportunity to present themselves. Um, now, if, uh, if we are now talking, so that's if, ever, if you're going to do sort of a forum, um, and if, if several candidates are going to be invited to speak, uh, we do want it, each candidate to be handled fairly and not under any preferential treatment. So we're talking about things like um, an independent, nonpartisan non moderator, if there's going to be a moderator, not favoring one candidate over another. Um, and I think this is a theme you're going to see running through a lot of these topics we're going to talk about, which is covering a wide range of topics. Um, covering a broad range of issues is often always better in the IRS favors than addressing only specific issues. Why? Because the idea of these forums and these debates is to educate voters. So when you have a broad range of issues, that is intended to be educational, address how the candidate would address issues, broad issues that it may, he or she may need to address if they actually get elected. Uh, as opposed to, if you're looking at very specific issues important, that are important to the charity, there's a greater risk that you're focused on issues where you really, what you are trying to do is, um, or what may happen is that you are identifying issues where the organization has a point of view, and um, you're telegraphing that those candidates who favor that point of view you should support, and those that don't you should not support. So if it was an environmental organization, I think this is one of those things, the facts and circumstances are important. If you just only environmental issues uh, that are wedge issues and, and it looks like one candidate is being treated more favorably than the other, that looks less partisan. Um, it's, but so a lot of these cases, again, it's not often a requirement that there be a broad range of issues, but that it is often a favorable factor that we support and that the IRS favors uh, to really make it educational and not about um, favoring one candidate over another. With respect to debates, I'll just touch this on, on, on briefly. It's similar to forums. But the key point is not showing any preference for one candidate or party over another. Um, again, wide range of issues for debates are particularly important um, because a narrow set of issues may suggest favor, uh, favoritism towards a candidate. Um, and again, equal opportunity to all the candidates and attempting to avoid comparing the organization's views with those of the candidates and showing one as positive and one as, as negative. Now, the last point I want to touch about in debates before we move on is in forums. Is it's not always practical for an organization to invite everybody, especially if there's a large number of, of qualified candidates. Um, so I think there's two instances worth referencing. One is what if you just can't invite everybody, or it's just not practical. There's 15 candidates. We saw this last year with the Republican uh, primaries. Well, the IRS has indicated that charity can invite fewer than all the candidates as long as there's a reasonable objective criteria. Uh, as to whom you're, you're going to invite, and you consistently apply that criteria. So maybe a threshold for how, many, uh, how they're doing in the polls, and everybody over a certain threshold will be invited, and if you don't meet that threshold, you won't be. Um, but you can't design criteria to exclude a certain candidate. We, I, I recall during the primary for the Republicans that if someone didn't get invited, that was often something that was criticized, of course, by the candidate who didn't get invited. But the IRS does allow you to make decisions like that as long as it's on a consistent, objective basis. Um, now, the other point I want to discuss is what if you do invite everyone and not everyone agrees to come? Well, it is unclear when a candidate's refusal to participate after being invited actually prevents the charity from holding the debate at all. Um, and that may be an area you want to consult with counsel. Certainly, if you invite five and four say yes, um, I think uh, you're in a pretty good shape. And of course, you just have to be careful not to be um, demonstrate any um, opposition or criticism of the candidate who decided not to, who may have politely declined uh, to, to sort of put that candidate in a negative light. Uh, what I think is trickier is if you <laughs> invite two candidates and one doesn't want to come. Um, I, I, it, I think many practitioners would say it would be very hard to have a, uh, a debate in that circumstance, even if you had a proxy or someone to stand in for the other candidate. So. Um, you know, it is a situation where you do have to look at overall facts and circumstances, but it's, if, someone, if most of the candidates don't want to appear as one candidate, um, it may be difficult to do so in a nonpartisan fashion. So let's talk about candidate voter guides and questionnaires. Candidate vote questionnaires or voter guides, those are materials that compare the candidates in a race, usually based on their position on issues. And uh, the voter guides are often 
gathered from information from you know, public sources about so, uh, candidates' pu legislative records, for instance, if they're an incumbent, or information from websites about where candidates are found on a certain issue. Now, for C3 charities, we want candidate questionnaires to be distributed for purely informational purposes. The reason you can do that as a charity is because it's educational. You do not want to favor or oppose a candidate based on issues. Um, I just throw in this slide to show here's an example of a voter guide. Now this is one page, but you can imagine there's a voter guide. So similar pages on different environmental issues. Look, if you develop or distribute materials um, that appear to be favoring, uh, you know, this is something, by the way, this would have been someone like the Sierra Club in this case, not a C3. So other organizations that are not bound by the C3 partisan prohibition, they can put out guides that have partisan purposes like a green voter guide that compare candidates' positions on certain issues, narrow issues. And I like this one because it shows that this is not, um, I mean, it's subjective, right? Not only do you obviously have an issue where it's an or issue that the Sierra Club clearly cares about, but the language there about supporting uh, one act and weakening another, and of course the, the checkpoint and a big thumbs down. I mean, this is a, is a good example of what you cannot do as a charity. But yeah, those are out there, and if they're out there, it's probably because it's not a charity who's, um, who's issuing that questionnaire. But if you distribute materials about candidates' positions um, for the purpose of educating voters, that's fine. Um, and so what we want, the reason, so again, we have similar uh, facts and circumstances that we consider. To stay on the safe side, we are again looking at a broad range of issues. Why? Again, because wide-ranging issues are less likely to tell or telegraph what the right answers are. And that's what, that is where a voter guy can get in trouble. Based on the language you're using or the way you present the information, does it really start to favor a candidate? Even if you're not even aware you're doing it, um, you have to be careful with the information you use, which is why it's important to use the candidate's own words whenever you can. So you want the, to be on the safe side. You want all the candidates to get the questionnaire. You want to ask open-ended questions and give the candidate an opportunity to explain. So you don't want loaded questions where they have no opportunity to explain their position. You don't want questions that really, you know, it's only one correct answer. Um, you want to avoid summarizing the questions and the candidate's positions if you can, because any editing can be subject to criticism that it was editorialized unfairly. Um, so again, broad range of issues. Print the answers in full wherever you can, or have a you know a reasonable word limit, or something that you don't want to make any editorial decisions. We've done voter guides where we said 50 words, and if someone wants to 55, we just cut it off at 50 because everyone was treated the same, and that was the, rather than try to summarize what they said. Um, again, getting to this question of what if someone doesn't respond? Uh, well, you can attempt to determine the candidate's position, position and summarize it, but you really want to be as neutral and unbiased as possible. You know, maybe there's something on the candidate's website that you can use um, rather than trying to uh, put, do something yourself that might be criticized as being subjective. Uh, so I think I'll, again, again, I'm happy to take any questions on voter guides. Um, but it, uh, if not, I'll, I'll just compare that to the legislative scorecards. We're here, we're, we're talking about voting records um, and these are actual compilation of votes cast by incumbents on, on bills. So unlike voter guides, these people are already in office, not the position of the candidates running for office. And there is a lot of guidance here about how, of course, something like a, a voter, a scorecard is educational. Um, and so they're typically issued short after, you know, you want it to be not necessarily tied to the election. Often these are issued after a close of a legislative session. If you have a track record of doing something like this, it of course helps to make the case that you are not being um, partisan right before an election to sort of cast a negative or positive light over any particular candidate. So um, again, there is guidance from the IRS on this. Um, scorecards, like anything else, can cover a single issue or a wide range. Generally, uh, a wide range the IRS, for the safe harbor of what the IRS says is okay for legislative scorecards, uh, we're looking at um, doing this regularly and including a wide range of subjects and including people regardless of their views. Again, this is meant to be objective. This is how they voted and doing what we can to avoid any explicit or implicit approval or disapproval of someone's voting record. Once you start to do that, you're more in the category of perhaps this is a partisan activity. Um, so anything else I want to say on this? So I think, 
Again, happy to take questions on legislative scorecards. This slide just goes over briefly sort of the different uh, where you might be on a continuum with respect to voter guides and uh, legislative scorecards. Comparing is fine. That's the idea. We're trying to be educational here about comparing candidates and questionnaires and voting guides and keeping obviously the organization's subjective opinion about whether those candidates are right or wrong out of the material. Criticizing, on the other hand, um, going on the other extreme, uh, yeah, that's something as a charity you need to avoid. Uh, making a positive or negative statement about candidates, uh, whereas advocacy organizations can do that, charities cannot. However, you can correct a factual misstatement related to your issue. This has come up, uh, I suppose not unsurprisingly in the last election. You know, a candidate may have said something, and, and some people said that was uh, on immigration or otherwise. Um, and we've had that question come up. Well, gee, what was said about uh, immigrants uh, in this country percentage-wise, uh, that's actually incorrect. Is that, are we reflecting negatively on the candidate to print the correct information? We take the view you can correct information on an issue um, without that being a partisan activity. Ranking, on the other hand, this is good to know there is actually a, a court case on this, that a charity may not publish rankings or ratings of candidates even if those ratings were determined by a neutral, unbiased process, a neutral, unbiased party, and without regard to political affiliation, doesn't matter because as soon as you're showing a ranking, that's obviously favoring the candidates higher ranked, if it's a positive thing, are going to look more favorable than those who are lower ranked. So the, the, uh, the, court has, uh, the courts have come out that that is a partisan activity not permissible for a 501c3 organization. I'm going to move on to ballot measures again. June, I'll ask if you want to jump in with any questions. Yeah, so, so um, people definitely um, took us seriously, and, and we've got a, a flood of questions. A couple about targeting. Um, one person is wondering, um, our organization targets teenagers to register and vote. One of the things they're doing is asking te teenagers to um, make statements about issues that are important to them, and then they want to publish this, the statements. And, what they're wondering is, could that get them in trouble if, for example, a lot of the students have strong pro-life feelings or something like that? Um, mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that? So they're asking students to – what these are, they're going to make statements and then the, sta the charity would publish the statements? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In the context of – so how would, where would the statements be publicized? And I'm trying to understand how – what the connection is to the, to the election. Is it a – so that, that's a great question, Andrew. If you're if you're uh, still on the line, why don't you um why don't you chat in and and in the meantime, um, while well, Andrew. Well, actually, chats before in, you jump to the next question, I did since you mentioned that. Let me while you're waiting on, let me just mention one thing, however, which is um, there is a question about well, it's one thing to ask these volunteers, individuals. There are questions about pledges when you ask a candidate to pledge that they're going to say one thing or another, or take one position or another, and it's in, actually an interesting point because. Um, that actually, as of now, is not permitted by the IRS for a charity to go out and get pledges from a candidate on a particular issue. Why? Because the concern is not actually getting the pledge but publicizing the pledge. So if you're on a no new taxes and we want every candidate to say that, the concern is that the charity will um, get the pledge and publicize it, or the candidate won't pledge and the charity will, pu will pu uh, publicize that. And that is really, again, telegraphing an issue that's important to the charity and saying those who pledged are favorable and those who did not are not favorable. And initially the IRS was going to allow the pledges to be fine, but told the charity you can't publicize this, and the charity went ahead and publicized it anyway. So now the IRS is taking a more restrictive view on pledges. Okay. So I, I've gotten some additional information um, from Andrew. So there, it's a social media thing. So they're going to ask kids to, to you know, make statements, post videos, use hashtags, um, do things on, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, so they don't – I don't know if they're able to like, curate or have control over, over yeah. what the kids are doing, but it's part of a sort of a unified campaign. So I guess I have two comments on that. One is if, assuming you have some control over it, right, it's just – if there are going to be issues like that, and that's clearly a, a wedge or an issue that divides the electorate and, and candidates, um, you know, questions, facts, and circumstances that are going to be relevant are, you know, are there also going to be references to an upcoming election or any reference to a specific person who may be a candidate? If you put those two together, you may have some concerns. Um, but secondly, I think this is something that's coming up more and more, which is, you know, I think what the charity has to do depends on is this going to be a moderated 
platform, in which case the charity takes responsibility for what's on there, um, as opposed to an unmoderated platform where we think if you really establish the ground rules and, and uh, that this is an open platform and you're not um, moderating it, that, and that's the, the value. It's meant to be a free and open space. Um, that the charity can take steps, and, and, and probably including disclaimers to make clear that that's what's occurring, uh, that the charity can avoid some attribution for the viewpoints that are put on there. In other words, someone publicizes something on there, but what we're trying to avoid is that being attributed to the, to the charity. Um, I don't know that it's perfect, and yes, there's some risk that if you open up the platform and, and you get a flood of people with a view one way, again, I mean, part of the difficulty here is it's a facts and circumstances analysis, and we only have the guidance that we have from the IRS. That being said, I, know I, think, if, I think the idea of an unmoderated blog um, that's clearly meant to be a free speech platform where you're really just taking off things that maybe are obscene or offensive you know, can be done in a way to avoid attribution to the charity. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, I can, I can see how it would be tricky because you can't really – you don't – you can't curate a hashtag. You can't control. I guess you can control what appears on your page, but okay. Anyway. Well, and, and um, I would just preface this before the next question is that the social media area is really hot, obviously, and we don't have a lot of guidance. We we try to read the tea leaves from the guidance that we do have, but I think whatever you're doing in these areas, you you get some advice, but also understand that you know there's going to be some uncertainty when you're doing things with hashtags and with. Facebook and things because we, you know, again at this point we're so just trying to figure out what the IRS um, expe expectation is, and I think IRS is still trying to figure out the social media itself. So that's just always always be right. some uncertainty there. Okay, here's an easier one. Um, can you target uh, as a, a C3? Can you target a particular district, um, not explicitly doing anything partisan, but in the hopes that someone will be um, ousted if you just get people to vote? So, okay, so targeting is a very tricky question. One of the things we're going to get to, I, I want to make sure we cover is issue advocacy. And this is the, the idea of uh, when we're talking about issues versus uh, trying to really thinly veil, or what may be a thinly veiled attempt to actually affect an election. I think this is where the targeting question comes up. Um, like everything else, when you're focused on an issue, you're looking at the content as well as where you're sending it, the message. Um, the IRS has said like everywhere else, it's a facts and circumstances analysis. The IRS has not included targeting as a clear factor with respect to issue advocacy, which again we're going to get to shortly. Um, but I, I do think in the context of issue advocacy, you do, to be safe, need to ask why you're targeting a specific area. And if the targeting, and there should be a rationale that doesn't have to do with an election. Uh, where we get concerned is that if you're targeting swing states with an issue or targeting an area where a cent – like for instance, um, let's talk about uh, for the Affordable Care Act. If you, are only if you have a message on that a clear issue and you are targeting only uh, areas where a senator is vulnerable um, to re for re-election, um, and you only focus on those areas as opposed to everywhere else, I think there's a risk that the targeting in those districts suggests that what you're really trying to do is affect the election. Not, and it's not an automatic, um, but that is that I, you know, we're more comfortable if there's a rationale for how you decided to target an area uh, that didn't have to do with somebody's election. Um, one big thing with issue advocacy in connection with election is we do think it's okay to inject an issue or attempt to inject an issue into a campaign. And if you think this is a place where, where people are going to pay attention, that can be, you know, there's nothing wrong with using an election to leverage your issue. But unfortunately, it's a facts and circumstances analysis, and so you have to look at all the facts, and the more you have that suggest it's related to the election, the, the, just the more risky, the risky that it is. And I think one point I'll make as a general point for all, everything we're talking about is, you know, unless it's a blatant um, you know, endorsement or some things are very clearly favoring a candidate, some of this stuff is going to be a judgment call, and organizations will have a different risk tolerance for some of this. And you will see some ads out there which, which I think could be questionable. And people will show them to us and say, well, how come they can do this? And the reality is um, some organizations may be willing – so there is a blurry line for some of this issue advocacy, and some organizations are willing to get closer to that blurry line than others um, and, and take on that risk. 
Okay. Hopefully I answered the question somewhere in there. But if not, <laughs> well, ask, that was all it, good ask it again and I'll try again. Um, so, uh, so a lot of questions about um, forums and, and debates. Um, if you are interested in doing a, a forum um, during a, a primary, do you have to hold um, forums for, for both parties or invite all candidates um, from both parties um, even if you know, it's a foregone conclusion? And then as an extension to that, what about a case where one party doesn't even bother to run a candidate because it's just so solidly red or blue, there's just like no point. Can you still do a, a, a candidate forum um, ahead of a primary for something like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so fortunately, there is some IRS guidance on this question about primaries. The IRS does allow a charity to hold a debate uh, during primary season limited to candidates for one political party um, because that's an election and, and that can be used as educational. And interestingly enough, the organization does not need to hold such debates for the other party's primary. And I suppose you could understand maybe why there just could be determined there's just not value um, for the organization to try and get uh, the other party to participate or it's not as big an issue. Whatever the reason, the IRS had, I mean, there is some guidance that, that you can do so for one primary and not another. Um, okay. Just in general, but certainly in a state where it's for so, uh, solidly red or blue, I would think that Really, again, you know, if your focus is the focus is to educate voters, um, you can do what's necessary to educate voters. And if there's only going to be one meaningful primary or one meaningful election, you can do that. I think what is harder is when um, you you know certain candidates are going to participate and certain candidates are just not going to in the same election. And that's where I think is a judgment call about um, where you can have a proxy stand in or have something providing that candidate's viewpoints without, you know, with being objective and coming from the horse's mouth as much as possible. Okay. All right, that, that sort of relates to um, this next question, which is the one that we, we always, always get. If you um, have a candidate forum or debate and there are only two candidates in the race and one of them cancels okay. at the last minute, yeah, what, do you, what are you allowed to do? Could you ask the prepared questions to the one candidate who does appear? Yeah. Uh, uh, this one is all, you're right. We do get this one. This one's always hard um, because I mean you gave some interesting facts. There. So uh, query whether if it's a, I, well, I would argue that if it's a, what you do if it's a very last minute thing. Um, I think the circumstances are different um, if then if you planned it well in advance and you know only one candidate is coming. Um, I do think that uh, t that's a difficult situation. I don't think there's an absolutely safe way to do it with only one candidate. Um, I do think, however, especially if it's late in the day, and you know, for instance, you sold tickets already, or you already have the event space. I think there's, and again, the best we can just make an argument. Because I don't think there's a, there's any explicit guidance saying no, you cannot do it, or yes, you can do it. But I think you have to make the case that look, we, we it's too late to cancel, um, and so we're going to try and and and, and do this um, as objectively and nonpartisan fashion as we can. And maybe what that means is it's less of debate than uh, you know, allowing that candidate an opportunity to pre present um, their positions. And again, maybe you make an open invitation for the other candidate to do so as well. And if the candidate cannot come on that date to do the debate on another date, to, uh, to at least make the effort of providing uh, equal opportunity um, to both candidates. But again, it's not an okay. ideal situation because I don't think there's. So I think you do have to ask the question about a: can it be? Can we do this in a in a way that's going to not completely be unfavorable to the other candidate? And b: is it you know what? I mean, if there if we given the circumstances, if canceling is really not an option or would be significantly adverse to the charity, I think that's relevant. Okay. All right. Um, so, all right. So th this this one. Um, I think might be might be a little bit easier. So, what about the case where um, you invite candidates to a gala or like a charity walk or a charity run, and um, you know one of the campaigns shows up to your charity walk um, in force, and no one from any of the other campaigns is around. Um, mm -hmm. What can you do in that case? Well, first of all, I mean before the event occurs, I would hope that there's a good solid record that there was this wasn't publicized in a way to 
all, for instance, posting in a million places where you're going to get certain campaigns to show up and not the other. Um, the invitation to publicity I think is, is important. right? I mean, if this is truly everybody knew about and only one side shows up, um, I don't think you have uh, much you can do as the charity. I think I would distinguish between events where the, where the campaigns just show up and participate in a public event and an event where they actually have some role in the event. So for instance, you know, if, if the charity allows somebody from a campaign to speak, I think you need to be very careful um, about doing that. And again, I think then you go into this category of, all right, if you're speaking and it needs to be in a, and there's only one party here, it needs to be in a non-candidate capacity. So is there a reason why we let you speak that has nothing to do with the election? Um, those are the types of questions we would ask. If it's just, look, we're having a race, people are here, they all showed up, but we haven't given any official role in the event uh, or any microphone or megaphone, to, you know, literally and figuratively, then I don't think you're either charities at, at much risk. I mean, the issue is, and this will always be an issue, is that there's going to be optics about how this looks, and maybe it shows up in the media, and you have people with signs um, that are partisan. Um, I think they're the best you can do is to really prepare for this in advance, have a good solid record, um, but this is a nonpartisan event. Uh, and so maybe that means announcing so for example, at the beginning. You, yeah, go ahead. You, you, might, you might advise people, uh, when, you, when you contact the campaign specifically, you might say, you know, please don't wear campaign t-shirts and buttons and hats or bring campaign signs, just bring yourselves. Um, so if you know if for you, that, if you know that's what if people are coming from the campaign, then yeah, I mean I think that's an interesting question, right? Because I don't think uh, I think from a legal perspective, you don't have to go as far as to tell people you you know don't wear shirts that have a candidate unless they are your volunteers. So if well, you're I'm having about event, if you're contacting if you're contacting the campaigns themselves to invite right. them to come, so like you're shooting an email to the campaign managers for like all of the city council candidates. In an email like that to cover yourself, you might want to say, um, please be sure that people don't wear you know, campaign clothing or whatever. Well, I, you know, I, think that's a, I think certainly you can do that and, and that is, would provide some safety, at least from an optics perspective. I'm not sure, I, don't, I would take the position the law doesn't, tax law doesn't require you to go that far in terms of um, preventing, at least from a legal perspective, attribution, right? I mean, what we typically focus on, hey, if they're your volunteers, tell them not to wear t-shirts like that, tell them it's a nonpartisan event. If you're inviting people, I think you, and it's anything in writing or a script, make sure they know it's a nonpartisan event. Um, but I, you know, and, and you can ask that, but honestly, I don't, and I think it helps you from an optics perspective because you don't want a lot of photo ops where it looks very partisan. But, you know, I think, uh, and I suppose you can, I would go as far to say, um, in certain contexts, like for instance, if it's a forum, uh, you could actually tell people not to bring that kind of stuff into the forum uh, where it looks more partisan. So I think, yeah, I think it's a step you can take. I don't think it's a required step um, in most cases, although I, under, I agree it would help you at least prevent a situation where it, turns, it starts to look like and turn into a campaign event. So yeah, I think you could take okay. that additional step. Okay, and here's, here's another one. So what if you're an organization that is focused as a, as a C3 um, on a, a, a particular issue? So like say you're right. a service provider and your focus is um, providing services to um, uh, people who are, who are um, handicapped in some particular way, for example. Um, and you want to have a forum that emphasizes those issues can, can you have a broad enough range of issues within your interest area to do that? So I think that's a very good question, and, and again, an area where there's not going to be a bright line, unfortunately. Now, the, remember, the reason for the broad uh, subject matter is to avoid indicating, sort of telegraphing, uh, that there's a specific point that, uh, viewpoint that's favored by the organization versus not. Um, I, I do think that certainly organizations that have a specific uh, matter that is, or an area that's of, of, of interest to them, um, there's, there's, I think, two things to keep in mind. One is, yeah, I mean, sometimes we do advise on try to at least have a variety of issues within that area to make the, you know, the, the less focused it is, 
the less likely it looks like you're telegraphing your, your answer. But I do think that you know, there's a bottom line, which is that this is overall facts and circumstances, and that if you're going to have a narrower range of issues, that does not mean that you automatically have a partisan event. I think it does mean that you have to take some additional, make some additional efforts to make sure that, um, that again, you're not uh, telegraphing a right or wrong answer to, to the, the issues that you're discussing. So there you know, may be specifically on this area, but um, candidates could have a viewpoint that's different on that, and it's not necessarily the organization's viewpoint one way or the other. So we're going to talk about um, disabled individuals, and we're going to focus on that area, but it's not a clearly partisan issue, or it's not an issue that's clearly going to, um, where, where the organization clearly has one viewpoint over the other. Um, I mean, I think, again, it's a little counterintuitive, right, because an organization like that may want to really focus on educating voters about their issue. Um, but I do think that uh, depending, you know, again, depending on the type of issue and how much it polarizes the candidates, you know, there is, if it's a very polarizing issue, there is more of a risk that focusing on that area is going to really, you know, uh, cast a negative or positive light over one candidate over the other. So you kind of have to look at the issue, and I do think it helps if you can you can, I, in my opinion, you can talk about a specific issue and try to talk about issues within that area. Like environment's one that we talk about a lot because it's easy, like, are we only going to talk about clean water and clean air? And uh, maybe there's a wide, wide issues or, or land conservation. Maybe a wide variety of issues within that particular area. But um, but I do think yeah, it depends on the issue and how much you can avoid it from a really um, telegraphing the organization's position on those issues. And um, again. Um, it's a risk factor. It doesn't necessarily preclude you from doing it. It means that there's some, maybe some greater risk that, that, uh, that it could look partisan. Okay, so hopefully, I, I know that we're, we're actually kind of getting close to 3 o'clock and there are some remaining slides. There are some great questions. So I, I want to do just a couple more. And, um, sure. and, and maybe we could just run over a couple of minutes if you're able to, to stick around for a few more minutes. No, well, it's, it's fine with me. It's almost lunchtime here in California, so I'll have to keep that in mind. But I, I can... Uh, I can hold off for, for extra okay. time if you'd like to keep going. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, so um, does any of the stuff that we've talked about make, it, make any difference based on whether um, the, an office is a, a partisan or a nonpartisan office? So in like a lot of municipalities, city council or mayor is a nonpartisan position. Um, does that make any difference to any of the stuff that we've talked about? So. Um, no, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm thinking of the if it's any office where it is elected um, by the public, and so it's, a, it's an elected public office. Then I think this is all relevant. Do you mean in the sense that there's not more than one person running for the office, or it's not a Republican Democrat kind of thing? That it's not a Republican Democrat kind yeah. of thing. You know, so like well, I, so with voter yeah. guides and, and and candidate forums and debates. You know what. Are your obligations any different um, if it's a nonpartisan election, a nonpartisan seat? No, I don't. I don't think so because uh, again, the, the test is for elected public office. So, um, you know, whether it's uh, board of supervisors or school district, um, if it is something that the public is, is voting on, then these rules would apply. So it may be easier. To have a nonpartisan sort of event, but I think the rules still, the rules still do apply. Um, so if there's you know, more than one candidate for an office, you need to make sure you're treating the candidates fairly, whether it's a political party affiliation or their, or their candidates, nevertheless. Okay. Okay. Cool. And a couple um, candidate questionnaire questions: um, sure. Are the rules on scorecards or questionnaires different based on whether a C3 sends those to, um, to members of the organization versus the general public. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is, that is, um, that is a good question. And uh, yeah, let me see if I can – I think it, it does um, – I think you have some more flexibility with respect to um, your membership. And I'm just going to look something up to see uh, – but actually, why don't you go to another question? I think I have some guidance on that, but let me see if I can find that and, and, and come back to that question. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so if a candidate is non-responsive when you send out a candidate questionnaire, um, uh, how can you deal with that? So I, I think, again, you, know, you look at um, 
questions like if you send it out to a lot of candidates, is it most of the candidates don't respond? Is it one? Um, I think again, something with a candidate questionnaire, which is I think a little easier than in an actual um, forum where somebody is uh, appearing, is that you know there is material out there often published by the candidates themselves that you can include um, an attempt to provide from their own materials responses to the question. Now, uh, it's always risk. The risk is the, the more editorializing that you're doing, the riskier that it is. Um, I think you can, however, either if you can either indicate very uh, in a very you know, nonpartisan fashion, for lack of a better word, that someone didn't respond, or you can try to provide information from their materials um, if you know you think that that material is out there and you can again, doing it as objective a way as possible, you know, direct quotes from materials that they put out. So I think you can do either one. Um, I think it may be safest if you're in a situation where you've asked five candidates and four have responded as opposed to none of them. Um, but I mean the point again is you are, you do, are allowed to try to educate voters on their issues. And if they're not going to respond, I think you still are able to try and educate voters as much as possible. It's just it's, it's, it's harder to be um, you're, you're more vulnerable to criticism because you're doing it yourself as opposed to using their own words. So the more you can use your own words, the better, but you can still do it. Okay. okay. All right. Um, do you want to go back? Yeah, so, and this is, I, mean, I'm, I don't know if it's off the top of my head. I know there's just some, I do think there's some more leniency with respect to member communications with respect to voting records. Um, so there are rep there's two revenue rulings on voting guides uh, and legislative scorecards, voting records in particular. Um, I think um, in one case the charity did distribute the voting records to members, uh, and uh, in that case, um, because what we're looking at is who you're targeting, and if you're targeting your members as opposed to more general voting electorate, I think you have some more leeway. Um, so in other words, I think. I'm just taking. Quick, I'm looking quickly at the revenue ruling. If you distribute voting records to members, right, without increasing the, news, the distribution, right? This is a you know you, you target members, you target them for other things, you target them for this specific thing. Um, I think, uh, and and in this particular revenue ruling, you didn't make they, the organization did not make a reference to the elections, did not indicate who's running for election, uh, you know, nothing that would start to compare candidates. Um, then in that case, and there were some other factors as well, um, but it, I think my point is, again, unfortunately we're in facts and circumstances, but limiting it to members as opposed to a broader sector of the electorate is a favorable factor. And in this particular revenue ruling, by the way, the IRS noted that the members only numbered a few thousand. So you know, if you had a very large membership, obviously that starts to look like maybe, or it's concentrated where the vote is, then, uh, then there's a greater risk. But um, I do think it's a factor. And then, and then you start to have to ask some of these other questions. Okay. All right. Um, so um, this one, I, I hope, is a is an is an um, uh, well. <laughs> I'm hoping this is a less complicated question. If if you have a, a, an event and a candidate just comes to your, it's open, it's an open to the public kind of event, and a candidate just shows up and starts um, glad handing and introducing um, yeah. herself and and you know, basically campaigning, what should you do in a situation like that? So this is not an event where they've been invited, right? They're just showing up. Um, right. I think you, right. So unfortunately in that situation, it's not like you can take certain steps beforehand. Uh, I do think that you want to take steps to, to stop that. And so I, mean, it's a, I think there's a question about what they're doing to do that. Um, clearly, whatever you do needs to be done objectively. So it should be for anybody who was to provide that um, activity. I think where this comes up, I think in practice where we've run into it is someone starts to have campaign material. Obviously, you can prohibit any campaign material in the hall um, or you know, at, at the event, and you can also prohibit someone from doing that. And I think you have to, well, I think you should ask them to stop. Um, and, then, and again, you can have some very clear language to start with that this is a charitable event. We're not permitted to favor or oppose candidates. This is not, you know, and the language can be something very clear for, that would apply to anybody, and you ask them to stop. I've never run into a situation, although maybe it happens, where someone disobeyed those requests or to continue to do it when you ask them not to. Um, but I think you should take the, the, the reason to take steps to 
end that activity really is twofold. One is obviously if you can discontinue the activity, there's less risk involved, and hopefully that's what happens. But secondly, you want to make whatever efforts you can and document them so if there's ever any criticism that could even lead to an audit, you have a good record that that was beyond what you could control. And that's why it's easier when you know someone's coming to the event because we can actually give them a memo or we can provide them with material ahead of time that says don't do this. If they just show up, you don't have that opportunity, but you should take whatever steps you can while you're, while you're there. The last point I'll make, and I think where we get into a fuzzier area, is when it's right outside the event, and then it's not clear what you can do about it. So if it's your hall and you rented it, you, can, you have some control over, you have the right to tell people not to do certain activities in that event. What if they set up a table 15 yards outside of your event? Can you stop them? Um, I think that's a much fuzzier area. I do think you want to take steps you can, but at the end of the day, they may be within their rights to be glad handing right outside the event. And not much well, that makes me think that. of that case where you might, you know, want to put on a charity walk. I mean, you're just, you know, it's a public street, um, so yeah. Right. I mean, maybe you should ask the candidates to to chill on the campaigning, but I I don't see that they'd have any reason to listen to you, really. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I, again, I think we're getting to areas where if you've taken safeguards, or, and again, a safeguard in this case may be to announce that the event inside, obviously this is a nonpartisan event. We don't favor or oppose a candidate. We don't have any control over what's happening outside the event, but just let's be clear that this is, this is not a partisan candidate event. Things like that I think should adequately protect the organization. I mean, I'm less concerned about things that people do that you can't control than the things you can do to sort of prevent that. And having, again, like many other things, having a good record that you did these things is a good defense if, if you have to, at the end of the day, defend something that somebody seizes upon as being partisan. Right. I mean, we always advise people to, um, to speak to a candidate if they're you know, soliciting contributions or something like that. Y you may not be able to get them to stop entirely, but you, you need to sort of make an effort so that if there is a complaint, you can say, well, you know, um, you know we advertised it as a nonpartisan event. The candidate was not specifically invited. Um, when they arrived, we, you know, and found out they were campaigning, we asked them to stop. Um, so right. you, you can cover yourself as much as possible. All right, so here's yeah, another so, question. Um, oh, sure. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, can I, uh, real quick, oh, okay. I know we're short on time. I was just, again, okay. referencing two very recent uh, current events I think are both a good points. One is document it, like you just said. Take steps, reasonable steps, and document them, like writing a memo about what you did so it contemporaneously. So someone who wants to know what happened, conflicting points of view, here's a memo real contemporaneously. This is what happened. This is what we tried to do to stop it. Secondly, take reasonable steps, but don't go overboard. I mean, I, if someone does not stop when you ask them to, I don't think – you need to have law enforcement remove them or try to physically remove them. This may go without saying, but obviously there's been issues with, with airlines where someone was removed. I would never want to take that step. Obviously, if someone mm -hmm. doesn't stop, they don't stop. Um, but you, you know, document the reasonable steps you took, but I don't think you need to go overboard um, and create what could be a more serious situation. Okay. All right, so he here's one. Um, uh, a C3 creates um, a legislative scorecard um, can you indicate you know, um, what the organization's position is in conjunction with how your elected officials voted on legislation? Yeah, so there, I mean, now I think we're getting into um, the specific guidance the IRS has issued. That I think is that it would not be within the safe harbor. Again, what does that mean? So the way the IRS guidance is set up in this area is that you know, there's a safe harbor, meaning if you do it the way the IRS has described, uh, that you are not going to have partisan activity. And that safe harbor would involve a, a broad range of issues where you're not um, editorializing on the positions. It's purely here's how they voted. If you indicate the organization's position um, and then the candidate's position, then I think, yeah, that's risk that that is going to be considered partisan, and I, I, I wouldn't do it. Um, because I, I think you have now editorialized or commented on specific votes. And what's very tricky is if it's an organization with a very visible viewpoints on certain issues, and then they do a legislative scorecard, it's very hard not, I mean, it's hard not to take the, or, or be at risk of the position that, look, you know, you are 
um, you were telegraphing to people that this is a bad candidate because of how they voted in their voting record. That's why um, the safe harbor involves doing this A on a regular basis. So it's not just before an election. And I think, by the way, it's something an organization can do now for an election in three or four years, two years or four years, to really establish that track record that, look, we did this every voting session. And so we're not, right. too, we're not dialing it up just for the campaign. And secondly, we know, again, that, that classic question, wide range of subjects. Um, if it's a wide range of subjects, it's harder to make the case that um, you know, you're just looking at things where if it's an environmental organization, you do a legislative scorecard on environmental issues, I'm not saying you're automatically in a partisan situation, but you are out of the safe harbor where the IRS says, you know, this is fine. The IRS will then look at the overall facts and circumstances, and you know, that's the problem. And then it's fuzzy, and there's a risk. Clearly, you don't want to editorialize on the legislative scorecard. But if it's clear what your issues are, and you have that scorecard out there, and you haven't hit a broad range of issues, there is a risk. Okay, so but what about the case where you, you, know, you have an annual legislative scorecard of the entire state legislature, you know, and you want to indicate yeah. your position. Isn't, isn't that a lobbying activity? So, yeah, so you know, that's right. Certainly anything we're talking about, if it, ha it involves legislation, could potentially be a lobbying activity. Now, I would argue if you're talking about legislative scorecard, we're talking about legislation that's already passed. So although this webinar is not about legislative lobbying, for a charity when you're talking about lobbying, we're talking about a bill, right? So once the, once the bill has been passed, we don't necessarily have a lobbying activity. But what we do have is an educational activity about, um, that's meant to educate voters. And I do think if you are doing it on a regular basis and you're you want to cover everybody, not just people who are candidates, um, then I think, you're in a, again, you're in a safer territory that, that this is not geared toward the election. Um, but again, all I can tell you is that the safe harbor where the IRS has listed in the revenue ruling factors that, are, that it would look for, that includes not editorializing or commenting on specific votes. But I think you can okay, present... That, that's a good... Yeah, I mean you can't present all information, but if you cover everybody and you do it on a regular basis and there's a pattern there, I think that, that's the goal, right? I mean you can, you're showing people how they're voting. Um, and then they can draw their own conclusions about the election. But you're not focusing only on people who are running for office or only right before an election. I got it. Okay, so that's a really good distinction. Because if, if it's like, you know, if it's legislation being debated, you have greater leeway in, in, in what you can do. You know, like, so if it's, not about the, if it's not about the elected official, it's about the legislation. You, you kind of had, you can do more. Um, Absolutely. Whereas if it's a you know if it's a guide then um, a scorecard then yeah I get it you're you're it's an education activity because we're not we're not in a lobbying situation anymore. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, um, and thanks too to the 84 people who are still here. Um, you know, 10 minutes past uh, the time that we were supposed to end. Um, do you want to try to run through any of these? Um, remaining I'd be happy. To. I was actually just that. jumping ahead to see. Okay. If there are any slides worth showing. So what I, I, can, I can talk for five more minutes, and then I obviously won't get Great. through everything. But um, where I think I left off, I was going to talk about ballot measures. Really, um, I think the slide pretty much says it all. Ballot measures are a lobbying activity because we're talking about the passage or defeat of a law. Um, so generally, charities can engage in ballot measure activity. What we do say is um, just be careful uh, about a nexus to a candidate. I mean, again, the IRS mantra is facts and circumstances. So, you know, if a candidate is really tied to a ballot measure, uh, then there's, you know, looking for that nexus. We've had ballot measures where candidates really tie themselves to uh, succeeding or failing. And if, if so, it does not mean that charity cannot get involved in that ballot measure, but be careful about at the same time not really getting involved with the, the candidate um, in some way that suggests that you're campaigning against the ballot measure and the candidate or you know, certainly you don't want to mention the candidate's name in a way that's a bad fact. And so it's, ballot measures are fine, but just be wary of that nexus. And then a lot of my slides here about issue advocacy, which I think actually is a very interesting area because, um, again, issue advocacy, the question is, is it issue advocacy or is it political campaign intervention? And the line here is often imprecise. A lot, there's been lots of lawsuits, I think, about whether or not this is 
permissible, you know, vague law uh, prohibiting you know, First Amendment rights to speech. But the general theme is, um, you know, are, are we favoring or opposing a candidate in some implicit way? And what you should know is that the IRS does apply a facts and circumstances analysis, but in addition to that, they've identified specific factors that help determine whether communication comprises campaign intervention. And some of those factors include um, when are you doing this? Uh, uh, you know, is it delivered in close in time to the election? And is there a track record? Uh, you have a history of working on this issue. Obviously, close in time before an election on an issue with no track record or bad facts, they indicate you're really trying to affect the election. And if you mention candidates and you mention their name and, they, and, and you address whether you approve or disapprove of their, of their actions, those are uh, bad factors as well. So you start to add up the factors uh, and ask, is this really the so a lot of negative factors here suggest that the issue advocacy really is about the election. And so here we just gave some examples. And I'll, I mean, I think this is common, but you'll see this. So, you know, thank someone for how they did an act, right? This per, let's say this person is going to be a candidate and is vulnerable in the next election. And um, this is a kind of question, well, is this issue advocacy? Is this about uh, the Affordable Care Act? Or let's see, we have factors here like we've mentioned a candidate. Um, is he a candidate or not? It's always an important question. Well, um, the closer the election you are, the more risk there is. But as soon as you're, you either you uh, expressly say you're a candidate or someone proposes you as a candidate, you're a candidate even if that's far out from the election. And honestly, more and more it's not too early to start thinking about that. President Trump announced his candidacy within his first 100 days. He is a candidate for office in 2020. Darrell Ice is a candidate if he's running for re-election. So you look at this and then this is the question, is this issue advocacy or is it something else? Um, and then some other examples, just again, is it an issue? We know you can focus on issues, but again, the IRS test is going to be, is this uh, a communication that really invites the audience um, to think about the organization's view and tries to tell the audience based on the issue how to vote on a specific candidate. And clearly wedge issues like abortion or uh, you know, um, 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 uh, certain um, 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 rights, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, well, environmental issues would be an example. Uh, abortion would be an, uh, would be an example. Um, or um, other areas that are clearly divisive uh, of the candidates. Healthcare is obviously a clear one now too. If you're focusing on that issue and you're tied closely to an election, you know you have to ask yourself: Is this about the issue, or is this um, in some way intended to affect uh, the upcoming election for a candidate? So, reproductive rights—that was the other word I was looking for. I'm sorry, it's been over an hour and I get tired. But that's um, that's the those kind of issues. Obviously, there's greater risk than issues that may be less divisive. Um, Given we're short on time, I think really that I'm not going to discuss what staff can do. Again, we talked about that last year, and I think that would really bring us to the end of my slides. And Julie, I'm glad I'm 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 happy to stay on if there's still people there and answer further questions, or you just let me know. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, let me just put out there are. Um, questions that we had um, still left over, like about 10 of them actually. Uh, but let me put out a last call too for people who have um, any remaining questions. Please um, uh, chat them in now and, um, and we'll try to take them. All right, so um, back to the questions that we had uh, previously. Um, is there any advice that you have for nonprofits um, publicizing groups that do candidate trainings? So there are a lot of groups, so there are a lot of interest in people um, running for office now, and there are a lot of, um, it, you know, de facto partisan groups that do candidate training. So like, um, but they'll advertise as groups that, that do candidate trainings for women or candidate trainings for women of color or things of that nature. Um, how, if, if you're a C3 and you want to uh, make sure that people know about these candidate trainings, what can you do? So candidate you're right. That is an area where, where um, organizations and often charities want to get involved. I think uh, you, if it is a, a type of training that can be uh, something that, that if people avail themselves across the political spectrum, that is, should be a relatively safe activity. So in other words, we're trying to remove um, sort of benefit to a specific set of candidates or a political party. Now, there's a very famous case on this sort of training called American Campaign Academy where the IRS 
know, there was this case about uh, it was a charity that was providing training to uh, people uh, to go take political jobs. And in fact, they were, when you looked at everybody who was trained and benefiting, they were all very largely high, high percentage working and going to uh, serve the Republican Party. Now what's interesting, and there are also other bad facts, like in that case the operatives from the political parties were doing these training sessions themselves and then moved it over to a charity. So there was clearly, I mean there's a very clear link between the training and the political party. Um, but the case is out there, and I think what's interesting and important to recognize also is the way the IRS approached it in that case was not that the vo charity violated the political prohibition, but instead that there was too much private benefit, which is another requirement on charities that they don't impermissibly benefit a private party or, or um, group of parties. And the position was that this was a private benefit to the Republican Party because everybody that was receiving the training was then going to work for the Republican Party. So the IRS used a different tool to get to that. So the point is it's not, nece it's not necessarily a, a, a prohibition, a violation of the electoral prohibition if you are trying to train candidates of you know, uh, gender or, um, or in a certain area or for whatever reason, but it's better, what you really want is, is it's riskier when you are only help, at the end of the day, only candidates of a certain party, for instance, are being assisted. Better um, that's the kind of uh, training that objectively anybody can take advantage of and, and may be of a different, uh, along the political spectrum, uh, not limited to, to specific candidates. Okay. Um, all right, so here's, here's an, an interesting question. Um, say you're a church and on two consecutive Sundays you want to have the two candidates for an office come and speak to your congregation. Um, can they come and present their positions on issues and ask people for their vote if the, if the congregation is having you know, both candidates come but on, say, consecutive Sundays or even on the Sunday, uh, same Sunday? Is that, is that allowed? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, that's a great question because I, I think – uh, I mentioned that there is this revenue ruling out there that we like, 2007-41, and that revenue ruling goes through a list of potential intervention areas and gives examples of what's an intervention and what's not. Well, in preparing for this webinar, I looked at that revenue ruling, and there is an exact example focused on this issue. So um, in the example, the minister does in fact invite a candidate to, to actually come to the congregation, um, and in this case, the intervention, political campaign intervention did occur because the church did not invite any other candidate to address the congregation. Um, and therefore, the, the implication is, and I think the other examples make clear, that if you invite both candidates and you give them an equal opportunity um, to appear, that that would not be a violation of the political um, intervention prohibition. So yes, you could okay. have a candidate appear, but the key is, making sure other candidates have the same access. And yes, you would ask questions like, is it consecutive Sundays, or did you ask one candidate for one event uh, with less attended than another event? So you want to keep it as non-preferential as possible. But um, that would be in the context of a forum where you are giving every candidate an equal opportunity. And you really, I think the, the reason behind that would be that you are educating your congregation. You're giving an opportunity for them to hear from the candidates themselves. Great. Okay. We had a couple questions about um, lobbying. One person was wondering, can you encourage either your members or the general public to in turn encourage um, an elected official to vote um, for or against uh, a piece of legislation? And I'm assuming the answer is yes, that it's a lobbying activity, <laughs> but there are limits that apply. Yes. So um, that's absolutely right. This is, again, now we're getting into uh, the lobbying questions, and here I can tell you that there are specific rules for membership. Unlike the, the, the can if we're talking about electing a candidate, and that question came up earlier where it's one of many facts and circumstances, um, I do think here uh, there are very specific lobbying rules uh, with respect to membership, and uh, some of them are more lenient towards um, your, your uh, ability to lobby. So in other words, when you're communicating with members, um, if you are encouraging them to contact legislators themselves, that is lobbying, but it's direct lobbying as opposed to if you were typically going out and telling people to go contact the legislators, that would be grassroots lobbying. I know this is a totally different topic we're not covering today, but there's a distinction 
um, between direct and grassroots lobbying for tax purposes. And so you get actually more favorable treatment if you are communicating with your members and telling them to go contact the legislator about a piece of legislation. So yes, it's lobbying, but it would be direct lobbying. That's a really good question. Okay, and then there was a, a sorry, a really good uh, answer. Thank you. Um, and then there was a question a uh, following questions. up on the. <laughs> on, the, on the church thing, um, uh, someone was saying that there are actually FEC rules that prohibit successive week events or forms for federal candidates. Um, can, you, can you comment just in general about um, IRS rules versus FEC rules? Yeah, so, and this is why I say at the beginning I'm only covering the tax rules, and the reason is, um, well, I guess there's two reasons. One of it is just, just only so much time, but really, the second reason, and the most important, is I'm a, I'm a tax lawyer, and I'm not a campaign finance lawyer, so I don't feel like I'd be qualified to, to talk about election law on this webinar. And that's why we said at the very beginning, this is the tax law. Um, that being said, yes, there are definitely rules that the FEC addresses um, these types of public candidate appearances. But you know, I think that is a separate body of law, and I, I couldn't really – what I can tell you is my understanding is that there, there is rules about the candidates appearing and being face to face, um, and so they may that may limit the ability to do this sequentially. Um, but I, I, that would be a question for a, for an election lawyer, uh, and I, I probably the, and it may be in the future we have an election lawyer and a tax lawyer to answer the questions. Um, because I know I've done publications where we've written the tax section and someone else has written the FEC section, for instance. That's a really good point. Okay, um, we need to consider that for the future. All right, um, uh, so um, I'll try to find a little bit more information about that to put into Oh, the actually, I, no, and again, okay, caveat that I'm not an election lawyer, but I am, a, I am sitting at my desk, and so I am looking at one of our resources that we've written. And um, according to the election lawyer whom, with whom we wrote this guide, this is an area where the FTC prohibits what the IRS would allow, is what he wrote. So, so okay. in other words, where a C3 can hold a form with, uh, with federal candidates, um, you would have to look at the more restrictive FEC rules as well if it's a federal election. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you to Henry for asking that question. Um, all right. Is there, um, is there any issue with um, uh, C3 collecting signatures to get uh, a ballot measure on the ballot? I'm assuming again, yes, this is fine, but it's another one of those lobbying activities. Well, again, okay, so we're going bleeding over from the, from the topic of the webinar, but yeah, I mean, now we're talking about ballot measures being legislative lobbying, and the question for a ballot measure is when it becomes a specific piece of legislation, and that is when it's submitted um, for signature. So yeah, I mean, you are, at this point, um, you, you, can, you can do that, but the question you're asking is, uh, uh, you know, at what point now do we have to treat these costs as, um, as, as lobbying expenses? Right. So an item becomes specific legislation when the petition is first circulated. So once you're circulating for, for signatures, it is, you know, that's legislation. So now you're, you're engaging, you, you would be engaging in lobbying activity. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, and, uh, oh gosh. Um, it, there are a couple more questions, but boy, you, you have stuck around for a long time, um, and so has our audience. So I think we should probably just um, cut it off at this point. Um, and just let me say thank you so much, David, for um, sticking around for a whole hour and a half and doing all of the prep that was necessary for this and doing it all um, pro bono. So we, we re really appreciate you um, sharing your expertise with us. I'm happy to do it. And I will say, Julian, I may ask for the questions in advance next time because these are some really good questions. <laughs> the questions are a lot. <laughs> uh, they're, these are pretty sophisticated questions. I hope I was able to answer um, the best I could given uh, that there's some pretty tough areas and there's not always a clear answer. And you know what, we, we have our contact information at the end of the PowerPoint, so people can always uh, um, contact you. Uh, no guarantee that you won't build them this time. But um, <laughs> yeah, so people can always free to contact you. People can always contact me. We don't, uh, you know, initially when we talk to people, it's, when it's not a billable conversation. So yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Great, great. And let me also thank the audience. We had, you know, I don't know, more than 30 questions from um, the audience today. Um, so thank you so much for you know, being a very active uh, participant in the webinar. Um, your questions make it uh, so much more educational than it, than it would be otherwise. Um, 
And let me just put in a plug. There's going to be a survey that pops up on your screen when you close the webinar. If you could take just a minute to give us a few comments about um, what we could do to improve the webinar and what you liked about it, um, we're always looking for um, feedback um, for people. So if you have any feedback for me or for David um, about our presentation styles or the subject matter or anything, um, please uh, uh, give us your feedback. Um, and a uh, last reminder that on Tuesday I'll send out a follow-up email that will include links that you can use to download the PowerPoint presentation or watch the recording on our nonprofit Vote YouTube channel. Um, and I'll try to include any links that, that, um, that were mentioned during the um, webinar today, for example, to that IRS um, revenue ruling that, um, that David mentioned. All right, thank you very much everyone. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you.